I know this video is about the 2015 game Dungeons 2, but f*** it. Let's talk about something completely different. Hands up anyone who has played any of the Dungeon Keepers. You know what? Bad example, because I can't see any of you. But for anyone who has played those two games, then if you leave your name and home address in the comments below, then I'll personally send you your own brofist for playing an awesome game. If you haven't played either Dungeon Keeper 1 or 2, then I'm afraid no brofist for you, and you'll get to know what it's like being a loser, and I have literally no idea where I was going with that. See, the thing is, is that if I'm going to talk about Dungeons 2, I need to talk about Bullfrog's Dungeon Keeper series first before it all makes sense. Dungeon Keeper was one of the first gaming series that let you play as the villain. The series played out as an overhead strategy game where each map or scenario takes place underground. A medieval kingdom of knights, dwarves, elves, pixies, etc. have set up shop and are doing quite well for themselves. However, deeper underground, an unspeakable evil has emerged that is now attracting all manner of hellish creatures from the abyss, and now this army of darkness is marching towards the forces of good with the intent of destroying and killing everything in its way. And that's where you come in. You play as the forces of evil as you set up your base, recruit and train your creatures, and then send them into battle to conquer each map. What sets these two games apart from your typical strategy game is that the map itself was kind of a canvas. Some parts of each map would be unchangeable, such as rivers of water and lava, but the rest of each map comprises of filled in rock and earth, which you could mine out in order to create rooms and corridors. This meant that each map was, in a way, a custom map. A map which you constructed and in a manner that served your benefits. Creating space and building your dungeon was a huge part of the game, as in order to attract powerful creatures through your claimed portals, you needed to have built certain rooms and have provided certain facilities. For instance, your creatures need a place to sleep, so you build a lair. They need food, so you build a hatchery that produces chickens. A library was needed to attract warlocks who would then research spells for you to use. Building a workshop would attract trolls who would then set to work, constructing different types of doors and traps for you to place in your dungeon. A training room, and in the sequel a combat bit too, were required to train your creatures to higher levels, and in doing so, they'd be tougher in battle, but would also gain new skills and spells of their own to use. And when battle finally came, you wouldn't be taking direct control of your creatures. Instead, you'd be providing battle support, and in a way, deployment tactics. Your job is to prepare your creatures for battle. It's your creature's job to actually go into battle. A major notable fact, for me personally anyway, was that there was so much variety in those games. Tons of rooms and traps to make, so many types of creatures to command, varied spells that augmented the experience, including a rather redundant but still bloody awesome possession spell that lets you take direct control of a creature of your choice in a first person perspective. It didn't serve to accomplish much and the combat whilst in possession wasn't all that worth it either, but it was cool to do. The theme of these games was, as the box art states, evil is good. You are the bad guy here. You're not going to be saving the day or rescuing the damsel in distress. You have invaded the forces of good's turf with the sole intention of slashing and burning everything that you lay your eyes on, and the atmosphere complements that quite well. Each map is dark and dank. The sound of slowly dripping water will follow you throughout the entire game. Some of the creatures you can attract are menacing and evil looking, and the narrator's voice is so sinister that I'd imagine that if you could convert his voice into a flavour, then it'd taste like apple sours. The sunlit kingdom of the heroes draws a little closer with each victory, and this was cleverly fought. Well done. There's a little bit of light-hearted humour here, what with the narrator making strange observations every now and then. One of your imps does a great impression of you. He can even do the ears. But this is a series that is dark and foreboding first, and tongue-in-cheek funny second. Everything worked well, and nothing felt like it was useless or even redundant. Even the really shit Fireflies served a purpose, because although they were the absolute worst in combat, they were excellent scouts. It's like everything in those two games just came together nicely to bring us an experience that is still enjoyable even to this day. Dungeon Keeper 1 came out in June of 1997, whilst Dungeon Keeper 2 came out in June of 1999, and both were massive hits. 
Then the tale of this series took a turn for the worse, and within a few years, any hope of there ever being a new Dungeon Keeper title was all but trodden on after Bullfrog was acquired by EA, and we'd never hear from it again. That was until EA released one of the most disgustingly criminal games ever, that being Dungeon Keeper Mobile in January of 2014, which was, and still is, the greatest shining example of what most AAA companies really think of you. In other words, all you are to them is a source of revenue. Dungeon Keeper Mobile didn't end the Dungeon Keeper franchise, EA saw to that many years beforehand. However, it did succeed in making sure that that franchise stayed in its grave. However, since that fateful day, there have been many ambitious projects and such that have tried to recreate spiritual successes to the Dungeon Keeper series, and today, we will be looking at one of them. This series, entitled simply as Dungeons, was first launched in 2011, where it tried to be a little bit different, presumably because it wanted to be recognised as its own thing, before going, F*** it, we've changed our minds, we want to be Dungeon Keeper after all, in 2015 with Dungeons 2. Now, many have tried to be the next successor to the Dungeon Keeper series, but does Dungeons 2 have what it takes to claim that title? No. No, it doesn't. Shit, should have waited till the end before saying that part. Look, in a nutshell, I like this game, and it does well to bring back all of that late 90s nostalgia but with better graphics, but Dungeons 2 just feels... incomplete, by comparison both incomplete and in that not as much stuff is in there, and that several changes have been made for no good reason at all. We're clearly the bad guys again, right? I mean, we're called the ultimate evil, after all. Well, you say that, but the plot is focused around the heroes of the surface venturing down into our turf and killing all of us. So, that means that we're the ones under attack here. We're now the underdog. So that means we're not the bad guys anymore. Well, that's a big part of Dungeon Keeper thrown out the window from the get-go. So what else is missing? Okay, let me level with you here. What Dungeons 2 lacks in some areas, it makes up for in others. But let's focus on the, for fuck's sake, why, before moving on to the time to backpedal with some positives. First of all, compared to what it's clearly trying to be, Dungeons 2 doesn't hold much content, or even a candle to its predecessor, if I'm honest with you. There aren't that many levels, there aren't that many rooms, the number of traps and doors you can create have been vastly reduced, training isn't really a thing anymore, and if you take Dungeon Keeper 2 for example, you could recruit, including imps, 14 different types of creatures, and all of them were vastly different from one another. In Dungeons 2, including imps, or snots or servants, whatever, there were five. Sure, there were two factions, both with different creatures, but each creature on one team had an identical counterpart on the other. Snots and servants did the same thing, trolls and fire demons practically did the same thing. Each team had some slight differences, sure, but for the most part, they're exactly the same, just with different textures. You could upgrade or evolve each creature to make them better, which the devs seem to think of as a new creature type, but I just see it in the same way as evolving a Pokemon. It's the same creature, only now it doesn't suck as much. And to make matters even worse, despite most of the good creatures being completely removed from the game, i.e. Bile Demons, Dark Angels, Dragons, and the Horned Reaper, Dungeons 2 had the audacity to talk about recruiting vampires as a possible creature, but then never actually allowed you to do it. In the Dungeon Keeper series, if you built a graveyard and then filled it with the bodies of fallen creatures and heroes alike, you could create a vampire which, not only was tough to kill, but would also resurrect every time after being killed in battle, though there were a few ways to put them down permanently. The vampire in previous games was excellent, and was a reward for investing a lot of time and money into your dungeon. Dungeons 2 didn't include it, which was a shame on its own, but I took it as a slap in the face that this game talks about how to raise vampires here, but then never actually lets you do it. Or did I miss something in this game and now I'm making myself look stupid? Hang on, I'm gonna Google this. Nope, no vampires, I was right. Another thing that kind of grated on my nerves like a cheese grater on my nerves was the overworld campaign map. Unlike its old man, Dungeons 2 had several maps you could switch to whenever needed. Your dungeon is located in the dungeon map, but in addition, you also have the overworld map, and in some cases, a couple of smaller rival dungeon maps. 
your dungeon map is where all the good stuff happens, such as creating your dungeon and making shit happen, and it played out almost exactly like you'd expect from a Dungeon Keeper game. The overworld map, however, suddenly takes away almost everything that was fun in the dungeon map, and turns the game into a mediocre version of Age of Empires, but without the building or trade. Once you have your professional squad of oppressed creatures, you can send them to the surface, highlight them, and then click where to move and where to attack. And that's it. Overworld done! And the overworld is where all of your story missions take place. There's no fun to be had up there, it's just completely dull. I got all of my fun back at my own dungeon, but the game forces you to abandon it in order to progress the story. Which was shit, by the way. Now, the devs of Dungeons 2 couldn't seem to get the guy who narrated the original Dungeon Keepers, mainly because he'd already been snagged for a different Dungeon Keeper spin-off, so I was thinking who would be the best to fill his role then. Naturally, I thought the guy who narrated the Stanley Parable would probably be the best choice, and hey presto, that's who we have narrating this game. For the most part, he does a good job, in the sense that he manages to deliver decent humour, and gives the player grief for not completing objectives quick enough. There are even shoutouts to the Stanley Parable here. Stanley was wondering whether he should return to his desk. <laughs> Sorry, in the as well as taking a moment to hold shit at Dungeon Keeper Mobile. However, there are times when the humour just falls flat, and I realise that that's not the narrator's fault. It's in the writing, but to give you an example, the entire level that parodies Game of Thrones was so unbelievably unfunny that it almost had me banging my head against my desk. They couldn't use the character names from the show, so I had to come up with other ones just to make up for it, such as Middle Finger instead of Little Finger, and John Tron Snow instead of Jon Snow. I wonder if they got his permission before using it. I know I didn't. But despite the humour here working... 9 times out of 10, I did feel that there was a bit too much of it, and that does have a knock-on effect when it comes to atmosphere. As I said before, Dungeon Keeper was dark first and humorous second. Dungeons 2 is clearly the other way around, and it seems to have lost a lot of potential atmosphere in doing so. Dungeon Keeper felt like we were a dark presence that was constantly scheming and spreading throughout the map, only stopping every once in a while to have a little giggle about something. Dungeon 2's reversed atmosphere makes it feel like we're less of a force of evil and more like a travelling circus. We're going to try to be funny for most of it, but there's something at the back of your mind telling you that there's something darker going on behind closed doors. But as I said previously, what this game lacks, it makes up for in other areas, so please excuse me while I start backpedaling. Despite not having as many rooms as in Dungeon Keeper, what Dungeons 2 does with its rooms is that it makes them more functional. In the two Dungeon Keepers, you construct a room and then you don't really have to worry about them ever again after that. However, Dungeons 2 adds in several micromanagement levels to their rooms which I personally thought was a welcome surprise. Let me give you an example. The hatchery from the original games has been replaced. If playing as the Horde, you get to build breweries instead. Don't ask me about what the hatchery's equivalent is if you play as the demons, because it fucking sucks. Now, to make a brewery functional, you need to assign a snot to it. Once done, he'll go off and make barrels of beer for your creatures to drink when they're... Hungry? However, you may eventually find that you're just simply not producing enough beer. So, you construct a new copper still within your brewery and assign another snot. That helps a little bit, but not enough. So, over to the Tinkerer's Cave, which is what the workshop is now, and select a few upgrades. Yes, that's right, this game includes room upgrades. Now, this seems interesting. The brewery upgrades includes increasing the speed of your snots so that they make beer more efficiently, and how many barrels of beer a brewery can hold before the snots at work decide that they're done for the day and go off to sniff your toes until told otherwise. I personally felt that room upgrades were a fantastic addition to the dungeon room system, and there are many other upgrades that can be used for almost every room. Attracting creatures was now done manually through your dungeon portal, letting you pick and choose which creatures you want to have at your disposal, instead of how it used to be by claiming a portal, hoping for the best, and then throwing all of your unwanted creatures back into the portal to try again. 
In conclusion, I'd say that Dungeons 2 manages to faintly remind us of the original Dungeon Keeper games every so often, but fails to take the title of Dungeon Keeper successor. The dungeon management side feels a little too bare, even with the new improvements. There's not enough variety or choice this time, with spells not being useful either. Oh, that's another thing, you can go the whole way through the game without using any spells. In fact, the only one I used was whatever the call to arm spell was, and even then, there were times when it didn't work. The overworld map was incredibly boring to deal with, and raiding other dungeons just wasn't very satisfying. If you're a fan of the original Dungeon Keepers, then I'd still recommend getting this game. It's just... Don't expect the next big thing, because it's simply not there yet. This game is like a robot trying to tell you that it's in love with you. It may be trying to sweep you off your feet, but it's missing a few parts for the magic to happen.